This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Imagine someone is committing crimes throughout the LA area on a regular basis. Maybe they've committed five crimes in the last month at these locations. How could we go about catching this person? One thing we could do is try finding a pattern in crime locations in order to make a prediction about the next one. That can be tricky though since there's likely a huge element of randomness. But decades ago, Kim Rosmo, a PhD criminologist, had another idea. He tried to find a formula that instead could find where the criminal likely lives. Based on past data, he noticed that criminals often don't commit crimes right by their own home, but also they don't go too far away. So from the data, you can determine a quote, hot zone, which isn't too close or too far from the crime scenes and has a high probability of the person living there. This is his equation for determining those probabilities. I know it looks complex, but it's actually not as bad as you think. Like take this P I comma J part. If we go to our map with the crime scenes and put a grid over it, any given square will be in some row we'll label I and column we'll label J. P I comma J is the probability that the criminal lives in that square. How you calculate that value for any square is with this right side of the equation. Now take this denominator. This first part just means take the arbitrary grid you're analyzing and one of the crime scenes and subtract their x coordinates, which gives you this distance. The absolute value just ensures that it's positive. Then this part just says do the same thing with the y's, which gives us this length. Add those up and we get the distance between the grid and the crime scene. No, it's not the straight line distance, but it is the distance if you could not move diagonal. And as we saw, this term is in the denominator, which means as that distance goes up, the entire fraction and thus the probability go down. This is expected because like I said, these criminals usually don't go super far to commit a crime. So a larger distance between our square and the crime scene means a smaller probability the criminal lives there, at least for this left term. But remember, criminals don't commit these crimes close to their homes either. And that's where this side of the equation comes in. Notice you have that same distance down here subtracted from something known as a buffer zone, which is just a constant determined by what works best with known data or past crimes. So as distance goes up, this entire denominator actually decreases, making the whole fraction and thus the probability go up. So physically, if you're too close to the crime scene, probability is low that the criminal lives there. But as you get further, the probability increases. That is, of course, until you pass a certain point, which is where the left side of the formula comes in again. Alter the distance, and these two fractions change in opposite ways, which is essentially the balancing act that creates the hot zone of high probability that isn't too close and isn't too far from the crime scenes. Phi is sort of a constant that I'm not gonna go into, and then G, F, and B are constants that just make certain parts of this equation matter more than others, or they add more weights to certain parts. Then lastly, this part I'm sure you guys know means we calculate those two fractions for every single crime committed and add the results. Do this for every square in our grid and we create a heat map of probability. What you're seeing here actually is the equation's output based on real crimes of a serial killer from the 70s named Richard Chase. You can see the crime locations in green and the formula predicts his residence will be somewhere in this dark region. His actual residence is plotted here in purple, exactly as expected. So at least in this case, Rosmo's formula works. His formula was put to use in the 90s and successfully caught a serial rapist, making Rosmo a celebrity in the crime-fighting world. Then for anyone who's a fan of the show Numbers, you may recognize all of this. In the first episode, there's a scene where Charlie Epps, a mathematician, looks out of a window at a sprinkler and says, although he couldn't determine where the next drop will land, he could figure out where the sprinkler head is located or the point of origin. He then tells his brother who works for the FBI that he can determine where a serial killer lives using the same analysis. Later in the episode, you see him working with Rosmo's exact formula and the heat map that it generated. It's a hell of an equation, Charlie. Now, the fact that crime deals a lot with humans and their decisions can make things tough to solve or predict, which is why we have to use probability like we saw earlier. But something that has helped in the past is the fact that humans are not very good at being random. Well, that's not totally true. Drunk texting our exes randomly at 3 a.m.? Humans are good at that, and you shouldn't mess with us. Still no response. Unbelievable. Come on, I even sent the winking tongue out emoji. On the other hand, being random number generators, we are not so good at. If we had a computer randomly generate, let's say 100 numbers that were all one through 20, and you did the same thing, 
it's very likely that an analyst would be able to figure out which list is the computer's and which list is ours. Because again, humans are not as random as they think. In a study, they found that people listed 7 and 17 way more times than the computer did. And even if you're aware of that, things like how often you repeat a number twice in a row or the lack of numbers that end in 5 or 0 because they don't seem random to us could also provide evidence that a human generated the list. In fact, in 2009, Iran held a presidential election in which one candidate won by a large margin, which prompted people to think the results were fixed. And thus, two graduate students looked at the total amount of votes that each candidate won in each province. Now, this would be over 100 numbers in total if we looked at all provinces, which I obviously cannot include on the screen. But if we did, we'd expect the last digit of those numbers to be random with an even distribution of 0 through 9. But that's not what happened. Number 7 appeared twice as much as it should have, as if the numbers were written by a human trying to be random. This wasn't proof, but it did point in the direction of some type of fraud going on. Or if I asked you to put 100 dots on a piece of paper, but make it look random, this might look like what you create. And it would be an immediate indicator to an analyst that likely a human was responsible for its creation, not a random process. When dealing with truly random processes, clusters tend to form actually. This is obvious, for example, when observing stars in the night sky, or if you threw a bunch of coins in the air and knowed where they fell. The problem is humans tend to view uniformity as random. During World War II, a statistician named R.D. Clark analyzed the pattern of bombs that were being dropped on London to determine whether they were random or targeted attacks since there was a high concentration of bombings in certain areas. While well, using Poisson distribution, the statistician determined the expected number of bombings to happen in a certain square area and found it to be extremely close to the actual number. Those clusters did not indicate targeted attacks at all like human intuition may assume. Those clusters should have appeared if everything was random. Now let's see a very real world application. If we look at any given school, all the students are connected in one way or another, whether it be through social media, classes they share, close friendships, and so on. And by analyzing these connections, we can thus make a graph, which is what you're seeing here. Now these aren't the graphs you're used to from school, but they have a ton of applications. They can be used to represent cities and freeways that connect them. They can represent Facebook connections. And these graphs are actually used a lot when it comes to solving or preventing crime. In fact, through FBI investigations, years ago a graph was created that included the terrorists involved in the 9-11 attacks and how they were connected. What they did, and what we're about to do, is mathematically determine who the key people in this network are and who should have been prioritized by law enforcement. Let's go back to the school example though. For any two people, we'll say they're connected if they are close friends or in constant contact with each other. For our hypothetical school, let's say there are 20 people and this is how they're connected. So there's a lot to take away from this already. Like these clusters we could interpret as friend groups or cliques at the school, such as jocks, band kids, and so on. Then we could probably consider this student to be the popular kid at the school since they have the most edges leaving their node, aka they are close friends with more people than anyone else. The amount of edges connected to a node, or seven in this case, is known as the degree of the node. But this is not the only important person in this network. Like what do you take of this person here that we'll call John? I wouldn't call John a popular student since his node only has a degree of 4, as do multiple other students, but he does stand out on this graph, and that's because he has a close friend in all the cliques at this school. Without him, the school would be disconnected. To show his importance, let's say a rumor is spreading throughout the school, and the faculty decides to investigate it. They find several people have heard the rumor, but they want to find who started it. So who would you go to? This is where John is a key player. In our hypothetical, once a rumor starts somewhere, it will quickly spread throughout that friend group, of course. But it can't spread across clicks until John hears it and spreads it himself. So if you can find out who John heard it from, then it becomes easier to backtrack and narrow down who is likely the person that started it all. John's node does not have a high degree, but it does have the highest betweenness score. To see what that means mathematically, take any two points on the graph, like these two I'll label A and B and find the shortest way for a rumor to go from one to another. In this case, there's two paths. It can travel this path, which requires one, two, three edges, but it can also travel this path, which is also three edges. So first you count how many of those shortest paths go through John, and we saw that both of them did. And then you divide that by the total number of shortest paths, which was also two, leaving us with a value of one. This is the betweenness of John as a link just from A to B. But if maybe these two people became friends creating an edge, 
that would create a third shortest path, also a distance of three. Still only two of those go through John though, so his between the score goes down to two thirds since he's not as required to get a rumor from A to B. If we calculated that value for every single pair of two nodes, finding the shortest paths and how many of those go through John, we'd have John's total between us score, which would be higher than anyone else's. Then there's one last measurement I'll discuss quickly known as the closeness centrality. If we wanted to calculate this for Mr. Popular, all we do is give them a point for every direct friend they have, or seven, just like with the degree score. But now you also give them two points for every person two away, or direct friends of friends, which would be three people. You give them three points for every node three away, which is three in this case, and you just keep going. In our case, the last six nodes are a distance of four away. Then you put all of that under 19, or the number of nodes in our network minus one, which just normalizes this value. And this leaves us with 0.413. Now, if we look at these four nodes, they all have the same degree score or the same amount of close friends, yet they all have different closeness scores with John being the winner, even though he's no more popular. So this score gets credit for how close you are to everyone overall, not just direct friends, and closeness scores are actually a good indication of how quickly information can spread through a network. So now let's pull up that graph of those involved in the 9-11 attacks. Again, it might be hard to see who law enforcement should prioritize, but if we calculate those three scores for every node and rank the results, we find what our eyes could probably not. That one person shows up at the top of each list, and his node can be found here. And it turns out this person was one of the ringleaders of the entire 9-11 plot. Although this was unfortunately found out after the fact, Graph Theory still singled out one person mathematically who would have provided a lot of information to US intelligence had he been caught beforehand. And whether it be terrorist organizations, street gangs, or a bioterrorist attack and how a disease will spread, Graph Theory is being used by law enforcement, criminologists, mathematicians, and so on every single day to track and prevent crime. Next up, another application of mathematics in crime is bloodstain pattern analysis. In fact, there's a lot to take away from analyzing blood patterns. Like blood that drops straight down from a wound will create a circular stain, whereas blood that hits the surface at some angle, maybe from a gunshot, will have a more elliptical pattern. Something you may not realize though, is that the dimensions of that ellipse are dependent on the incident angle, not the speed of the fluid. So different speeds will yield the same pattern if their angle of incidence is the same. But using this, we could still work backwards to recreate a crime scene. In 1995, a man named Warren Hornick drunkenly called the police, saying his wife just committed suicide by shooting herself. Upon arrival, there were bloodstains on the man's shirt that he said got there when he tried to give his wife CPR. Everyone believed he was innocent except for one analyst who said the tiny size of blood spots had to originate from high velocity occurrences, not due to giving CPR after the fact. That same analyst then backed away from that claim and eventually said it was the lack of a blood splatter trail that proved it was likely a murder. As of last year, Warren still resides in prison due to this finding from one analyst, yet many people think this is not proof and it is possible they sent an innocent man to prison, but no one seems to be sure. And in 2011, a woman named Brittany Norwood murdered one of her co-workers in the store they worked at. She even tried to stage the event by tying herself up afterwards, claiming intruders had raped both women. Eventually it was determined she was lying, and then prosecution had to prove it was first degree murder. Upon further analysis, they found bloodstains under a nearby bookshelf, which could not have gotten there from a standing fight due to the required angle of incidence. This proved that Brittany Norwood beat the victim as she lay unconscious on the ground, and it was evidence like this that got Norwood life in prison. Now, in the United States, the largest employer of mathematicians is actually the NSA or National Securities Agency, who need mathematicians for breaking encrypted messages, doing signal analysis, and more like what you saw in this video. Even university professors in mathematics get contracting deals with the NSA when they need help with specific cases. So for anyone going into math as a career, this could be something you end up doing. But for anyone looking to learn more about real-world applications of mathematics, including its use in criminal analysis, then I highly recommend checking out Brilliant, who I'd like to thank for sponsoring this video. Brilliant is an online educational platform that includes a wide variety of math and science courses, ranging from basic algebra to vector calculus and quantum computing. Their courses take you through the technical material you need to know for these subjects, but they also constantly test you along the way to ensure you understand the information. The example problems you will come across often have unique real-world applications that will help you understand the material on a deeper level and make you think more like a mathematician. 
As you can see here in their physics of the everyday course, you can even learn more about this criminal analysis like the math and physics of blood splatters or how collisions can be reconstructed. And if you're really trying to keep your math and science skills sharp, they even have daily problems that make learning a habit. These provide you with the context and framework needed to tackle a wide variety of problems on a daily basis from what happens when you cut a Mobius strip in half to logic puzzles and how to uncover the truth in complex situations. And if anything confuses you, they have a large community of thousands of learners discussing these every single day. So if you want to still be productive while procrastinating that really boring essay you currently have to write, or you just want to learn something new, then head on over to brilliant.org slash major prep or click the link below. Also, the first 200 of you to do so will get 20% off the annual subscription, giving you full access to all courses and problems within the archives. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything. Hit that bell if you're not being notified, and I'll see you all in the next video.